starting with the first part that I want to with the journey of the cross. And here we have just a few days before Passover, and Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, he's chilling with Lazarus. How cool would that be, right? That dude was dead. Now he's having dinner with Jesus. He's chilling with Jesus, and they're eating dinner, and he's relaxed moments before his crucifixion. He's just relaxed. Isn't that crazy? Sorry, but if I knew I was going to die in like seven days, I probably wouldn't be having dinner with you. I'm just saying, right? I mean, you look at Jesus, and he's just having, he's entertaining. You know, like, no, they're wrong. Get the Tupperware out. Let's have some dinner. You know, he's not, he's not freaking out like I would be. No, I'm going to the cross. You know, no, he was just relaxing. Why? Because he had peace in, in God. He was called. Amen. And let's begin reading our text. It says, then... Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who, had, who was who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, as usual. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of very costly oil, a spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, just so you know, 300 denarii is about a year's labor wages. A, that was a lot of money that just got poured all over Jesus. All right? Very costly. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. <laughs> and he used to take what was put in it. So Laz or Judas is going, hey, man, I could have had some of that money. Give me that money. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Surely I say to you, wherever the gospel, this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Here we have, in its full entirety, just a beautiful picture of Christ's work upon the cross and the reaction of those who have truly received it. You also see how Christ came to die for the ungodly, and when the ungodly realize that they are forgiven in Christ, there is an overwhelming reaction of gratitude and thankfulness and worship and love being poured out. It's just really interesting, as you take the three characters, you see the gospel played out in its entirety. See, as I was telling you about earlier, that as I was going to do a section called Don't Be Judas, I came to realize that in my overbearing religious judgment, I somehow convinced myself that I would never be a Judas. You read this scripture and you're like, man, how, how could Judas betray Jesus? How, how could you do that? When the truth of the matter is, just between me and the 50 people that are here, I struggle with my inner Judas every day. But see, that is what makes the gospel such great news. It is his saving grace that has overlooked my own personal betrayal towards him. And in the light of that betrayal, he says, I choose you. I love you. I forgive you. You are mine forever. See, to truly understand the beauty of the cross, to truly understand the price that was paid, we really have to become honest and intimate with our betrayal. See, it wasn't Judas' betrayal that sent Jesus to the cross. Your notes here say this. It was the betrayal of mankind. It was our betrayal that deserved the cross. 
As I said earlier, Judas was infected by a disease, a genetic and contagious disease that we all share, and it's called sin. The Apostle Paul does such a phenomenal job in the book of Romans getting us to understand this. Because I can even feel in some of our hearts looking at Judas and going, well, I'm not that bad. Right? I do it. I always thought of Judas as a scoundrel, that little punk. You get intimate with my Savior and double cross him behind his back. I mean, think about it. Jesus allowed Judas into his inner circle. This wasn't some vagrant that just passed by and decided, I don't like you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to betray you. No, this was somebody he was intimate with on a daily basis, shared his secrets with, laughed with, ate with, dined with, prayed with, went to the temple with. They were arms in arms, brothers. All right, Judas was one of the 12. That betrayal went deep. This was an act of defiance like we couldn't even imagine. I mean, to see Jesus eye to eye heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, see the proof of his sonship of the Lord, and still say, you know what? No, I'm turning you over, man. I'm selling you out. It's easy for us to look at him and go, Judas, bummer for you. Judas' sin was so great that it, the Bible says that it was better that that man not be born. Truth of the matter is our sin is just as great. And without Jesus, it's better that we not be born. Because without Jesus, we're on our way to hell. And that's where Judas went. So I just want to very quickly explore what Paul says in Romans just to make sure, all right? I have to make sure that you understand that your stink is as bad as Judas's stink. I have to, not to make you feel awful about yourself, because we're going to get to the good stuff, I promise you. But you can't appreciate the fullness of the gospel if you think for some reason you are more righteous than someone else. The Apostle Paul, as he's going through Romans, begins to talk to the people in chapter 1. He begins to talk about the failings of Israel. And he begins to say how they, he actually quotes a psalm and says they Began to, they changed the, they exchanged the image of the creator and began to worship things of creation. I'm paraphrasing here. That's a psalm that was referencing when Israel rebelled against God and built a golden calf and made their own God. And remember, and Moses comes down from the mountain, he throws his commandments on the floor and breaks the things that God had written with his own finger and got so mad that he slayed like thousands of people that day in the vengeance of God. I mean, it was a heavy ordeal. And you can see that as he's going through Romans, the people, the readers that were receiving this were going, yeah, man, they're, they're awful people. They're sinners. I got, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. And then in chapter 2, he's so brilliant because he kind of pulls the, ru the rug out from under them. <laughs> as they're shaking their head, oh, and sorry, in chapter 2, as they're shaking their head, yes, I remember their sin, and it's awful, he pulls the rug out from under them and then begins to point it back at them and says, but your sin is just as bad. He says this in chapter 3, Romans 3, verse 9 through 13, says this, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all, everyone say all, they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Apostle Paul, in this amazing book of grace he writes in Romans, is trying to get everybody to understand, uh -uh. 
There is no one righteous. No, not one. We're all scoundrels. We're all betrayers. We have all exchanged the glory of God for the lusts of the flesh. We are all enraptured by this disease called sin, and that's why we need Jesus. That's why it says on the front of our window, Jesus is everything. Without him, we are nothing. We are broken. We are bruised. We are lost. Amen? We're miserable. We are destined for hell, but in Jesus, thank God, we are forgiven, we are loved, we are accepted, we are made righteous. So the Apostle Paul, as he embarks upon this great book of grace in Romans, he wants to make sure right out of the gate that his readers understand that no one has attained any type of righteousness. As a matter of fact, he goes in at one point and says, if you think that you can save yourself, just be perfect all the time. Because that's what it takes. And he goes on and lists. It's funny. But he's so great. You should read chapter 2 and 3. Because he's talking about the awful sin of Israel in the wilderness. And then he goes and says, have you ever been angry? Then your sin is just as bad. You ever spread gossip? Your sin is just as bad. You ever been mad? You ever back bit? Selfish? Whatever it is. And he lists all these sins. And as I was reading them this week, I was like, oh, uh, oh, yeah, I've done that one, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm pretty selfish. Oh, I'm angry. Yeah, sometimes, okay. But he just makes it very, and I have to, I can't drive this home enough. Church, you're not thankful for your salvation until you really realize and are honest with how bad your sin is. All have sinned and fall short of our glory of God. Let's look at our notes. It says this, we... We all have a Judas, that's your feeling. We all have a Judas working on the inside of us. We all possess the nature to look the creator square in the eye and betray his lordship. See, that's what gets me about Judas is because, man, he looked Jesus eyeball to eyeball. Think about that. This was as... The gospels describe it. This is the word incarnate. This is God. This is the word in the flesh. I mean, I I can't. I begin to read the Old Testament and I read through the gospels and I'm reading through the Bible and it's just like, okay, Jesus is all of that. He is the word, the logos, which just means the word from heaven. He is the revealing of God himself. If God had flesh, it was Jesus. That's who he was. He embodied God. And think about Judas' ability to look at him eyeball to eyeball each and every day, break bread with him, spend time with him, but yet still deny him, betray him, turn him over, man, sell him down the river, however you want to say it. We all do this on a daily basis. No, I don't, Pastor Aaron. Really? Okay, so on the way here, did you argue with anybody? (laughs) When you got here, were you upset that the music was too loud? Okay, good. (laughs) Are you getting my point? You ever been selfish? You ever gossip? That one's hard, right? Right? Oh, I got something to tell you about somebody. Right? Hey, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have this disease within us. We all have the ability to look Jesus square in the eye and betray his lordship. Amen. The scary thing about the gospel is that it reveals the Judas within us. The beautiful and amazing thing about the gospel is that it forgives and erases the betrayal of the Judas within us. So not only does it forgive us, it erases it, takes it off the board. (laughs) Hebrews says, I will remember their lawless deeds no more. It's gone, out of his mind. Sin has been erased, overcome, defeated. The power of it has been lost in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is only righteousness for those who are in Christ Jesus. They've been clothed with his glory. Amen. We've been forgiven. Our Judas has been forgiven. It's been erased. And in its place, we've received his righteousness. Pretty good deal. 
Romans 3, as I said there earlier, but I'm going to continue on with the verse because the Apostle Paul would never leave us leaving on, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, okay, <laughs> before I go going, let me just make sure that I read that to you again. For all have sinned and fall. I hear people quote this verse, and it's so funny. Even in our flesh, we just do it. They say, for all have sinned and fallen. Past tense. No, the scripture says, all have sinned and fall. Everyone say fall. You ever fell? See, it's a consistent thing. Oh, man, I'm trying to get you guys some good news here, and you're just like, oh, you're just, your churchiness is not letting you get it today. It's okay. I'm a mess. You're a mess. We're all a mess without Jesus. For all have sinned and fall continuously short of the glory of God. However, being justified freely, everyone say freely. Being justified freely. Quit trying to earn it. Quit trying to earn it. It's been given to you freely. You can earn it. As bad as you are, as Judas works within you, Christ freely gave you his righteousness. Oh, see, that's why it's good news. But for some reason, we've got it in the church. Let us get you in the door. Let us get you saved. And now, let's make you perfect. Ain't going to happen. I've got to shatter through this religion. Some of you just aren't. You're, you're battling with me in your heart. I get it. I know. Man, me and, you, we're, and some of you are like, you know, this is old news. It's not old news. It's the news. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Remember Isaiah? He's going off on Israel about their sin. Telling them sinners and betrayers and how awful they are. And, you know, I bet you through his prophecy, he felt pretty good about himself. And then all of a sudden, God took him up to the throne room. Do you remember this story? What was the first thing he did? He fell on his face. And begin to cry out because of his sin and his wickedness. Begin to say, oh my gosh, I've seen the glory of God. And my, wretch, my self-righteousness has been destroyed. It's been dem- I cannot compare to the righteousness of what I've seen. As a matter of fact, he cried out and he said, Lord, touch my lips and make me clean. And God took the coal, remember, and touched his lips and made him purified to where he could even stand in the presence of God. See, the prophet said, even my self-righteous acts, even my good stuff is as a filthy rags before his glory. See, when you look at the cross and you see Jesus hanging there with blood pouring down his body, you begin to realize the level of righteous requirement that is in God. Because it was taken out upon his son on the cross. The brutality of the sin equals the level of righteousness of God. But we have been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Not ours, his Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that we had previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier. Everybody say justifier. You need it continuously, church. Yes, we are all better than we used to be in Christ Jesus. Thank God for that. I'm not a drug addict anymore. I'm not... Connected to all that stuff that was darkness and misery. I'm not angry anymore. I've let a lot, I've been delivered from so many things. But I'll tell you what, when you go before the Father and you begin to look at the righteousness of God without Jesus, man, we can't even stand. And so daily we need to go after the one who is a justifier continuously of us. He is a justifier of the one who what? Has faith in Jesus. That's all that the gospel is about. Believing in his grace. Believing that his sacrifice was for you. Believing that he is Lord of all and you get free grace. Wow. Your Judas has been forgiven freely and all he asks is that you believe. 
the deeper that that gets into us, the better, quote unquote, we become. Don't clean up what's on the outside. Get a revelation on the inside of who you now are in Christ Jesus. He has freely given you his righteousness, freely given you his grace. In spite of the fact that you argued with your spouse on the way here and you kicked the dog out the door and yelled at your children for being stupid children, you're stupid children, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> whatever happens at your house that you don't want anybody to know about, and Jesus is going, yeah, see, I am a justifier. Right? And then we get here at church and we like button up our show. Oh, no. Bless the Lord, my brother. My sister. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, we're like holier than thou. Righteousness exudes from us. You know? Nah, no, man. We all got Judas in us. Can I get an Amen. Let's go on in our notes here. The love. Everybody say the love. The love of God made our Jesus, made Jesus our Judas. And exchanged, gave us his righteousness. Our problem is we are not perfect at being perfect. <laughs> and we forget that the cross has set us free from the expectation of perfection. Let's go on in our notes. God's expectation of perfection has been fulfilled and satisfied through the cross. Do you get that today? Your call is to not be perfect. Your call is to love Jesus and have faith in his work on the cross. If you don't get anything that I say today, please get this. Circle this. Highlight it. Hang it on your mirror. Make it your mantra. Christ, God doesn't desire perfect people only forgiven people whose faith in Christ come on now <laughs> whose faith in Christ is greater than the faith in their sin some of you guys got so much faith in your sin your sin is all you are you're just continuously living in it oh no I'm just you need to get more faith in Christ than you've got in your sin. More faith in his redemption than in your inability to be perfect. Come on now. God doesn't desire perfect people, only forgiven people. How do you know this, Pastor? And because in Matthew 9, 10 through 13, it says this. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, okay, let me just put this another another way. And when the church people saw it, that's who the Pharisees were. Come on now. They were the church people. And when the church people saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I bet you Jesus just went, What? And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <laughs> if Jesus was <laughs> walking the earth today, and he came up here, church was open, and let's just make believe that that bar over there was open. Which one do you think he'd go sit down in? <laughs> and all the church people would be like, why do you eat with sinners? Why are you having chicken wings with the dude drinking all that beer? I don't know, man. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I think it depends. I think that if in this place we realize that we are in desperate need of a Savior because of the brokenness and the Judas within us, he'd probably come in here and say, hey, you guys are sick. I'm a physician. Let me heal you. 
But if in our self-righteousness we look down upon the sinners over there in the bar, oh, just how could they drink that way? You used to drink that way. And even if you ain't drinking beer now, have you ever gossiped? Have you ever been selfish? Ever been angry? Ever been backbiting at the boss at work? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. But the good news is that Jesus didn't come for those who are well, those who are righteous, those who are perfect. He came for those who need a physician, those who are sick. You know, again, Jesus doesn't expect perfection. He just wants you to admit that you're not perfect. Can I get an amen from somebody? All right. You with me? Let's move on. So we've all been given extravagant forgiveness. You realize that today? And extravagant forgiveness equals extravagant worship. What a stark contrast we see between the reaction of Judas and the reaction of Mary. Both were infected with the same disease, but only one realized what they needed for the cure. Judas was infected with self-preservation, self-gratification, self-reliance. He was infected with himself. Mary, on the other hand, was aware of herself, but more, everybody say more, more aware of what Christ had done for her in spite of herself. The cost of Mary's worship was about 300 denarii, or about one year's wage. It was above and beyond what others would think is necessary or wise. I just very quickly want to read this description of who Mary was for you, really quickly, before we jump into what she did here. Are you with me? Are you saying with me? Okay. Luke 7, 36 has the same account that we're reading out of our other text, but it gives a little bit of better description of who Mary was. It says, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. In other words, he went to the the church elder's house. Okay? And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, what did it say? I I, I stepped over that. A woman in the city who was a what? A sinner, right? And when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Why? Because she's been forgiven. He who has been forgiven much worships much. I want you to get a mental picture of this. Here's this woman. Now, there's some debate about was this Mary Magdalene. We know it was the sister of Martha. We do know that for sure. But is the sister of Martha the same as Mary Magdalene? There's some proofs and texts that, yes, there were. There's some proofs and texts that maybe she wasn't. But there is some proof that this woman was delivered from quite a few demons. Some texts suppose her to have been delivered from seven demons. Ooh. She stood behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil and now the church elder or the pharisee i'm not saying our church elders but some who had invited him saying this he spoke to himself saying this man if he were a prophet would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner sound like anybody in the church you ever run into verse 40 and Jesus answered and said to him Simon I have something to say to you <laughs> so he said teacher say it there was a certain creditor who had two debtors one owed 500 denarii and the other 50 And when they had nothing with them with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. 
But to him, little, little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Whew. This is why this woman could not stop crying over him. Let's go on in our notes here. It says, when we truly realize the depth of God's extravagant forgiveness, we will worship extravagantly. And I say this in love, I really do, but that's why sometimes it's hard for me to understand as a worship leader why I look out at a congregation and I just don't see anything. I see people just going, oh. and I know some of you think, I wish you'd just shut up. Well, what time should we go to church? Well, you know, worship gets over at about 1045, so we'll get there about 1040. There are people who do this. You think I'm kidding? When you realize the extent of the betrayal within your heart, you realize that his forgiveness has covered it. Man, I'll tell you what, there is no stopping your worship. Flesh or not, man, you just get free in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you. You know, I'm going to set some of you free. I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. And I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I really do. But I'm trying to set you free. <sighs> Extravagant worship. There are people, in, and I see it, because I'll exhort us. Will you lift your hands up to Jesus? And I look out in like three people. It's not about ritualistic. It's not about anything like that, but... Let me just challenge you with this. Some people say, I will never lift my hands and worship for Jesus. He lifted his hands for you on the cross for your forgiveness. Extravagant worship, when you realize the extravagancy of your forgiveness, should encapsulate everything that you are. It really should. And lifting hands is scriptural. Holy Spirit-driven Pentecostal church. Amen. He says, lifting up holy hands unto the Lord. There is something that happens. I'm telling you. See, I'm trying to help some of you get free this morning. There's something that happens when you begin to lift up your hands unto Jesus and say, you know what? I want all of you, God. Fill me up. I've been forgiven much. I mean, think about it. What was this Pharisee upset about? Because this woman was making a fool of herself. I've got Jesus here. Do you not get who he is? And you haven't come in, you're just spilling your oil all over him and crying and snotting all over What would you do? If you had, let's say, like some dignitary over to your house and some lady just walks in and starts, ah, starts wiping all over her hair. You'd be like, you look, what are you doing? Get up. No, man. Extravagant forgiveness knows no boundaries of the flesh. You just want to worship him. You just want to give it all back because, are you kidding me? I was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? As you run to Jesus, you run to him and say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Every day I need you on a continual basis. See, I'm even doing it now. I can't help but lift my hands. Why? Because I want him to pick me up. You remember that? I you that illustration a couple weeks ago when you're, my kids were literally coming. They like start jumping. They want me to pick them up. They're like little jumping memes. I'm like, okay. And then they would get bigger and they'd come and like launch into your arms. You remember that? And you're like, wow. And there's nothing greater as a father, is there? There is, man. I, just, I wish my kids would go back to that. Now they can't. They're too big. They do that. They'll kill me. <laughs> but remember, I mean, it's just so precious. We are his children. Jesus said, if you don't come to me as little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means simplicity of faith, crying out for Abba, Father, my Daddy, my God. The one who saved me has forgiven me on a continual daily basis. See, I believe that as we get wrapped up in our own self-righteousness is when our hearts become hard and it's harder for us to worship. How could it be that David could sit out in the middle of nowheresville? With the sheeps and the goats, pick up his, I'm going to call it a guitar. I don't know what it was, but he would pick up his instrument and begin to worship. Get lost in the presence of God, man. Just 
losing. I mean, just worshiping him with all that he is, man. It's because he was in love with God. I go on. You know that I love you, right? I'm just trying to exhort you. I'm telling you, God can set you free. When you get free from your flesh and worship, whoo get free from your pride, get free from your self-righteousness, get free from your image. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm goofier than looking than all of you, so just look at me and go, look how stupid he looks up there. I'll look stupid too. Right? <laughs> For we were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Right? which are God's, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Do we give him the precious ointment of our best afflictions? Let, them, let him have them all and love him extravagantly with all of our heart. I've got to hurry up here. All right, I'm not that bad. Not as bad as usual. All right. The next verse is, And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil, John 12.3. The fragrance of extravagant forgiveness fills our hearts with freedom. The freedom of extravagant worship fills the atmosphere with the fragrance of Christ. I can tell you this, I know when I'm around a worshiper. And they may not be perfect. But I know when people's hearts are towards God and they realize how desperately they need him. Because that's a worshiper. Somebody who says, you know what, man, on my own, I'm a mess. I'm, I, I'm, oh, but God and his righteousness and his glory. Hallelujah. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. When you worship extravagantly, the atmosphere is filled with the fragrance of Christ. Amen. But we talk about not allowing people into our inner circle that might hurt us. Well, Jesus knew that Judas would betray him and allowed him in anyway. Right? I, David wrote this in the Psalms. It just gives you an idea of how deep this betrayal was and how risky Jesus' love for him was. It says, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exhausted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man of my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and we walked to the house of God in the throng. This is, I believe, describing Jesus' feeling about Judas betraying him. And many of us have felt that. You've been betrayed by somebody close to you. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, but he picked him anyway. I love what the message says about that verse I just read. It said, this isn't the neighborhood bully mocking me. I could take that. This isn't a foreign devil spitting invictive. I could tune that out. It's you. We grew up together. You, my best friend, those long hours of leisure as we walked arm in arm, God, a third party to our conversation. Our notes say this, Jesus' dangerous love and acceptance of Judas is the perfect example of what it is like to stop needing for yourself and giving your life to others. Our notes say this, there is only one whose love will never let you down. Everybody say, only one. For those of you who are newly married, I will tell you this, your spouse will inevitably let you down. <laughs> your friends will inevitably someday let you down. There will be people in your life that are close to you that will let you down. It's going to happen. Why? Because we're all infected with a disease called sin, right? There is only one whose love will never let you down. And relying on him alone enables you to love others freely. See, the reason that Jesus could allow Judas in is because he didn't need Judas' love. 
He only had love to give to Judas. The only love that Jesus needed was the Father's. Do whatever you want to to me, man. I don't care. I got the love of the one that matters. See, and that enables you to love freely. That enables you to give dangerously. That enables you to allow people in that, yes, they might betray you. They might hurt you. There is someone here this morning. Oh, hallelujah. There is somebody here this morning that has, you've guarded your life and not let anybody close to you because of the past hurt in your life. Jesus can set you free from that today. That as you are filled up with the love and the forgiveness of the Father alone, then you are enabled to bring people back into your life. Who wants to live that way anyway? Yeah, you may never be hurt, but you're going to be awfully lonely as well. Relationships are a gift from God. Our friendships are a gift from the Lord. Amen. He gave us each other so that we can encourage each other, lift each other up, but eventually someone's going to let you down, and it's okay. The love of the Father is the only one that you need. Amen. Let's go on in our notes. Oh, I love this one. God's expectation of perfection has been satisfied through the cross, right, of us. We said that earlier. God's expectation of us and perfection has been satisfied through the cross. Therefore, our expectations of others should be satisfied through the cross. Why can you love a scoundrel? Because you be a scoundrel too. <laughs> right? When people let you down, just look at them through the eyes of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that applies to them as well as it does to you. And realize that, oh, only by the grace of God. Amen? This is just a little side note here. Be careful of the expectations you place on those around you. Be careful of the expectations you place on those around you. You may set yourself up for disappointment and unforgiveness while setting them up for failure. See, when you set your expectations so high, you're setting the person up in the relationship for failure. Why are they? There's no, they have no chance of being perfect. It's not going to happen, right? Again, in the eyes of the cross, we begin to realize, man, you know what? The only one who's perfect is the one that hung himself on that cross. So therefore, it takes the expectations off of our relationships. And if you expect perfection from somebody, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to have unforgiveness, and you're going to set them up for failure. This is a great advice for people who are married. All right, let's go on in our notes. It, will, it is always easier to see Judas in others than it is to humbly admit that there is a Judas at work in us as well. In fact, we often use the Judas in others <laughs> to magnify the self-righteousness within ourselves. Jesus said this. I love this because people use the scripture about giving. I'm sure the same principle applies, but they're always like, oh, I'm going to be blessed, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Do you know that that scripture actually had to do with judgment? If you go back and read it. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And just in case you didn't know, and Jesus was probably trying to make this very clear, it will take a long time for you to get that plank out of your eye. Right? Right? Now, there is a principle of some, some people have been delivered from some, some things. We can bring truth into other people's lives about that deliverance, okay? But what Jesus is getting at here is you all have specks in your eye. You, you're all blind by your specks. You're all blind by your sin. You all got your stuff. So quit looking at the other guy's stuff, calling him Judas, right? And thinking that you're more righteous. All right. Last couple notes. Even Jesus had a Judas, so chances are you're going to have a couple. <laughs> I've got good news for you. Jesus said 
that as they hated me, they're going to hate you too. As they despise me, they're going to despise you too, right? Ever wonder why you're ostracized for your faith? Jesus said, what they did to me, they're going to do to you. So if Jesus had a couple of Judas, or had a Judas, chances are you're going to have a couple as well. So just get ready for them. All right, just, again, quit placing your faith in the work of humanity. Place it in the work of the cross, and you'll be all good, right? All right, I love this one right here. And this was my little, only little, I stayed good through all of it about keeping it pure gospel, but these last two were my only little kind of, like, life lessons. So here's another life lesson. Jesus needed his Judas to fulfill his destiny. So maybe your Judas isn't a setback, but a setup. So that person who has betrayed you, that person who has hurt you, that person who has left you, look at it as an opportunity for a promotion. Right? I mean, Jesus needed it. What? He needed to be crucified. He needed Judas to be crucified. But most of all, he needed Judas so that he could be resurrected. (laughs) So maybe the Judas in your life isn't a setback as you thought it is. Maybe it's a setup. Maybe it's a time to move forward in life, to grow in your faith, to grow in your forgiveness, to grow in your love. Amen. To move on with Christ into deeper and better things. I don't want to say up in Christ because we are all up in Christ, but move on with Christ.